Good morning. Good morning. International Studies. I'm Andrew Schwartz. I'm our Vice President for External Relations. Uh, and I'm pleased to see all of you here, and I hope you enjoy um, some of the t-shirts and the, the reports. And uh, The t-shirt we made up uh, was for this series specifically, and we're going to be continuing to, this series is an ongoing series, uh, partnership, in partnership with the University of Miami Knight Center for International Media. And I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of CSIF and the Knight Center. Um, we have a terrific panel today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the one report, obviously. Um, and I think that, you know, this series has really brought a lot of the Millennium Development Goals out uh, for people to examine and assess and see where they are. Uh, we're going to be, this will probably be our last session for, for the summer, and then we're going to start up again in the fall, so I hope to see some of you here for that. Um, with this, I'd like to turn to my colleague, um, Richard Downey who is a senior fellow in our Africa program and has uh, graciously agreed to moderate this. And with that, Richard, take the word. Thanks very much, uh, Andrew. And, uh yeah, as Andrew just explained, the theme of this series is to look at issues uh, surrounding the UN development, uh, Millennium Development Goals. Uh, and this morning, we're going to be looking at the important role that the richest countries in the world have been playing in helping the poorest ones uh, to meet those challenging targets uh, by 2015, uh, targets such as achieving uh, universal primary education, uh, eradicating extreme poverty and hunger, and, and six other uh, very, uh, very ambitious targets as well. So back in 2005, representatives from the G8 group of leading economies met in Glen Eagles in the UK and made a series of big commitments to Africa. Uh, these commitments were meant to go a long way towards helping African countries achieve uh, and meet the MDGs. Uh, they included a collective pledge to more than double by 2010 the amount of official development assistance to given to Africa, also to cancel the outstanding debts of the poorest countries. And they weren't just uh, monetary pledges, there were also commitments to boost not just the quantity but the quality of aid given and also to free up uh, barriers to trade with Africa. Well, this year, 2010, is the deadline for meeting those uh, ambitious Glen Eagles commitments. Uh, and a good time to reflect on, on the progress made. Uh, well, the One organization has been helping us uh, to do that. Uh, One is an advocacy and campaigning group working to combat global poverty and preventable disease, as, as most of you probably know. has more than 2 million members worldwide, uh, and it's been at the forefront of efforts to hold the richest nations to account uh, on the promises they made back in, in 2005. Uh, it's got a newly released report, which uh, many of you will see, a big chunky report, uh, data report, uh, and it's a comprehensive attempt to put the uh, G8 and the other donor countries under the microscope uh, and see whether they've been willing to put their money where their mouth is. So we're very grateful this morning to have uh, as our main speaker uh, David Lane. He's the president and CEO of, of One. Uh, prior, prior long illustrious career before one, yeah. uh, was previously Director of Public Policy and External Affairs and, and Director of the East Coast Office for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, and previous to that, uh, held a number of senior positions in federal government, uh, including Executive Director of the National Economic Council at the White House, uh, and also Chief of Staff of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, Mr. Lane holds a Master of Public Affairs degrees uh, from the Woodrow Wilson Center at Princeton, uh, and uh, also an undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia. Uh, in addition, also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and Vice Chair of the Board of Transparency International uh, USA. So Mr. Lane is going to uh, give us a snapshot of the data report's main findings, and then we're going to broaden the discussion out, and I'll bring in our other panelists who I'll introduce properly later, but uh, Joshua Great. Bolton on my right and Paul Alice Marsh on my left. Great. So anyway, over to you. Uh, um, thanks, David. Thank you, Richard. Um, that was completely unnecessary. And I'm not going to stand up. I think I'll just do this sitting. I know most of what I, what I think I need to say. And I want to thank uh, Andrew Schwartz for bringing us together, CSIS and University of Miami, you, Richard. And I'm really honored to be sitting here with Pearl Alice and Josh, who's also my board member, so I'll be on my, my best behavior. Uh, one last thank you. Erin Thornton is over here, and she is the guru of this report for us uh, at One and has been doing so for years, and she did a great job. And if it gets really technical, <clears throat> or you want to ask about methodology, we'll, we'll bring Aaron up here. Uh, let me just say a word about one, what one is. We're a global anti-poverty advocacy organization. We work with lots of you. I recognize a lot of people here in town. We're co-conspirators with many of you. Um, focus mostly on, uh, as, as Richard said, the rich countries and their commitments 
um, to Africa, where, where, where we have offices in London and Berlin, uh, now Brussels and Paris, and we kind of worked the G8 circuit because that's the, that's the framework that we thought was, uh, uh, provided the greatest, greatest opportunity to uh, increase, uh, to change policy, improve policy, and increase the flow of resources to Africa. I should say, uh, uh, we had a trip to Africa in March. Josh was part of it. Uh, one of our founders, Bono, was part of it. And at the end of the trip, he scratched his head and said, you know, I wonder if we've been misnamed all along. Maybe we shouldn't be one. Maybe we should have only been one half because we're focused on the rich countries, but look at all the stuff that's going on down here where we ought to be engaging more fully with African voices in terms of uh, their leadership and supporting their leadership. And, and to be honest with you, as an organization, we're wrestling with that right now and trying to find better ways uh, to engage more directly uh, with, with countries in Africa, though we do, we do have staff there already. Um, the data report is our annual um, effort to hold the, the G7, in this case, accountable for the commitments they made in Glen Eagles. Um, DATA uh, is the original name, is the name of the predecessor organization, Dead AIDS Trade Africa, Democracy, Accountability, Transparency in Africa, which was always meant, and you probably know that organization, that's the organization that used to lobby Josh when he was both chief of staff and, and director of OMB at the White House. Um, uh, and I think it was a very effective policy and lobby outfit, and then we merged with one to become more of a, a grassroots organization so that we bring all the tools sort of in one place um, to mobilize uh, support for development. Um, this report is the final one because it's the final year um, of, the <coughs> of the Glen Eagles commitments. It may live on in some other form. We're thinking about ways that it should reflect new, new accountability metrics going forward. Um, but we actually launched it two weeks ago. We launched it in... Um, in London, in Paris, Brussels, Berlin, and in Canada, where we're trying to put some pressure on the Canadians <laughs> as they lead uh, this year's G8 uh, and to get them to focus on accountability. I should say, at the same time, the Africa Progress Panel also released its report in Cape Town. That was very important to us um, <clears throat> because we have always believed this is a two-way street, and their report said that African countries themselves need to be mobilizing more resources to fight poverty a focus on health and education and many of the things that we're focused on and said that, in fact, there are resources there that can be mobilized much more effectively. And I think that's important, and I want to I convey that message as well. Um, so the headlines of the report. Uh, we clearly believe that um, the, la the, the last five years, the period since clinicals, have seen historic increases uh, in aid flows and in... Uh, debt cancellation to Africa, and that there's a lot to show for it. Um, you can focus on disappointments, and I can highlight some of those. But in fact, by the year 2009, uh, the G7 have delivered on 44% of the commitments made to double uh, assistance to Africa. I think it was actually costed out at 22.7 billion or something like that would be, would be the doubling. Um, by the end of 2010, uh, our projections, and that we think they're pretty sophisticated, Aaron and her team have done a nice job of sort of uh, projecting what the 2010 numbers will be. We believe they will have delivered on 61% uh, of the commitment. Uh, that's disappointment in, in, in some particular cases, and 61% is a little more than half full. But um, by any measure, $13.7 billion, which is the number that has been delivered over this period, is, uh, is pretty dramatic. It's more than double uh, the rate of increase in the five years leading up to Glen Eagles. If you were, and I'm not playing a game, uh, but if you were to take out the bogus Italian commitment, which was to meet 0.7, uh, where they have, in fact, not grown at all, but in fact shrunk by 6% since that time, uh, the, G, the other G6 would have delivered on 75% of their commitment. I think that's a, that, that's a, a fairly impressive uh, picture. The, um, all of you know that, that dollars only matter to the extent that they that they have yielded results. And I, and I think it's very important that we always focus on actual results. And again, I think the record of this last decade, it has been a decade of development. We've seen 42 million more kids in Africa uh, uh, in primary school as a, result of, as a result of debt relief from 50,000 people in ARVs in 2002 to more than 3 million today in sub-Saharan Africa, more than uh, 200 million bed nets as a direct result of the Glen Eagles commitment. And again, bed nets are not an ultimate outcome, but uh, malaria deaths cut in half in a number of countries, Zambia, Ethiopia, Rwanda, there's a lot to be said for that. 
Um, vaccination. I think 257 million more kids vaccinated as a result of uh, uh, largely the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, which uh, I think they uh, can accurately uh, pinpoint 5.4 million lives saved as a result of effective immunization. So I really, we, our organization believes there's a lot to show for these dramatic increases in, in foreign assistance. Um, debt forgiveness, uh, just to, to remind everybody, and the report lays this out, Glenn Eagles was not just about money, uh, but there were uh, debt cancellation commitments as well. They were met early, uh, right out of the gate. Uh, there was a lot of action on bilateral and multilateral debt, though our report issues a bit of a warning on there that there's some backsliding countries converting from grants back to loans because it's an easier way to leverage their meager resources, uh, countries borrowing more, and, and we're, we're concerned about that trend. Should also point out there were commitments made and not at all kept on trade and investment. Uh, probably a lot of stuff. In, in, in one sense, the commitments were vague. They were about making trade work for Africa. Uh, when you make a vague, vague commitment, it's hard to know whether you've, whether you've measured up, but I think uh, nobody with a straight face would claim that, uh, that that commitment has been delivered on. There was probably a lot of stock placed in Doha, and everybody knows uh, the frustrations with Doha. So that's a disappointing um, area. And um, we believe as an organization there's much more that can be done in that area. And Josh is my board member. Uh, it was another one of our insights from Africa. It's an area that we as an organization can focus on a, a, to a much greater extent. Um, the U.S. piece of the picture, the way we've been characterizing the seven performances are that some countries aimed high, well, one country aimed really high and didn't deliver at all, that's Italy. Uh, uh, France and Germany aimed high and have had a hard time delivering. They're at the 25% of their commitment. Um, Canada, we, we've been comfortable saying Canada, Japan, and the U.S. made modest commitments and exceeded them. I'll get back to the U.S. in a second. And the, the U.K., I think, really is a superstar. They made really bold commitments. They're committed to, to spending 0.7 of their GDP uh, by the year 2013, and they're damn close to doing it. Um, when you say the U.S. made a modest commitment, I think that's usually a characterization of of development assistance relative to GDP. In absolute terms, of the 13.7 uh, billion that we talked about, 5.4, I think, uh, is, is the U.S. increase in aid to Africa. President Bush, at the, Glen, at the time of Glen Eagle, said we had doubled it so far and we're gonna double it again. That was the commitment to get to 8.8 and, and uh, the U.S. Will have, will have exceeded that. It actually exceeded that in 2009 and the 2010 projection means we exceeded by a healthy uh, degree. I think 158% uh, is, the, is the number that we've calculated. I should point out, so that this report, and I'm not saying this because Josh is here, that is largely a Bush administration achievement. It was a Bush administration commitment, and the delivery, if you look at the pipeline and how uh, numbers flow, those, that is delivering on the Bush uh, commitments and um, Bush performance. Uh, we will also say that I think President Obama has pivoted in a way that builds on that and so has announced uh, a global health initiative of $63 billion, food security initiative, I think $3.5 billion of new money in three years. Uh, the path continues for the U.S. and President Obama has, uh, has uh, committed to doubling U.S. foreign assistance uh, without a specific number on Africa, which is something we as an organization are, are looking for. But um, the U.S. has had a strong performance and we believe is is a leader in health and some of these other sectoral areas, and um, we as advocates need to, need to, to uh, continue the momentum in that area. Um, and, uh, and that the U.S. has an important leadership role to play going forward. So now the last few things I'll say is about going forward. Uh, what are the lessons of this for us? Um, I just want to restate that results matter, and we think there have been substantial results, especially in the health areas over the last few years, and that's important. As advocates, it's always important that you let people know that what they've advocated for has made a difference, but I, I, I think uh, we can all say that with, with confidence. Um, the second finding, I guess, for us is a response to the question, does the G8 or does collective, do collective commitments matter? And we would say they, would, they do. Uh, as disappointing as it is that a country would only deliver on 25% uh, of what it said it would do, I 
don't think many people believe that $13.7 billion would have flowed to Africa from the G7 without the mutual pressure that the G8 commitment uh, yielded. And I think that's a good thing. And we want to find ways as an organization uh, to replicate, not, not exactly the same way, but, but to, to, um, to garner additional uh, shared commitments with some greater specificity. There's a real lesson here about accountability. We've embraced something we call the track principles, which is that commitments um, need to be transparent, results oriented. You need to know uh, they need to be specific about additionality, about conditionality, and you need to be able to measure at the end of the day whether they were kept. Uh, that's something we think is very important. Uh, probably we wish that at the G8 last year in the L'Aquila food commitments that somebody had followed those practices because they were a little squishy and it's hard to know how the G8 is doing on its commitments from last year. The Canadians, the good news is the Canadians are deeply committed at this G8 to, uh, to publishing an accountability matrix to look at what the G8 has done in the past to live up its, to its commitments, and that's very, very important. So the last point I want to make is that even though we've described this as the end point, this is the end of the data reports that measured the Glen Eagles commitments, we really just believe it's a, if it's a turning point. Um, this is... Uh, uh, step along the way. We really are counting on the G8, even though this is a tough time, to put forward a bold maternal and child health initiative, uh, to get much more sp specific about how they hold themselves accountable going forward. And we believe that's a, that's, a, that's a key moment as we head towards September, where if you were um, paying attention last September when President Bush, uh, sorry, President Obama went to the, uh, the UN General Assembly, he made a very bold statement about uh, this year's UN General Assembly. We call them the 36 words. I don't think he thinks of, I don't think anybody in the White House thinks of them as the 36 words, but Bono said so in the New York Times. We're trying to make it real. That by the time we come back this year in September, we want to see a global plan to get the MDGs on track and that he really believes that uh, extreme poverty can be eliminated in our time. Um, so we've yet to see the administration's plan. We want to see a national development strategy, uh, but we think an MDG plan is a, will be an expression of that. Uh, we're eager to see that soon because they don't have a whole lot of time to then take it and multilateralize it and, and try to sell it into as more of a, as, a, as a global approach. We believe that's very important, and we're going to be spending most of our energy between now and September as an, as an advocacy organization pushing for that. Um, I think I exceeded my limits. I hope I gave the basic findings of the, of the report, and uh, we'll be happy to elaborate or call on Aaron later. Thanks, Richard. Thanks very much, David. Well, uh, plenty of strands to pick up there and material for uh, a good discussion now. And, and to help us get into the details, I want to bring in our other panelists and uh, introduce them. Uh, you, you have their biographies in front of you, so I won't go into all the, uh, all the details. But um, just uh, pleased to have on, on my right here Joshua Bolton, who's uh, on the board of directors at One. And uh, as David mentioned, former White House uh, Chief of Staff under uh, George uh, W. Bush, President Bush, from uh, 2006 to January 2009. Uh, on my left, uh, joined by, oh, and I should mention actually to update that you're now teaching at uh, Woodrow Wilson <laughs> Center as well, so uh, alumnus there. Um, and on my left, I, we have uh, Pearl Alice Marsh, who's the majority professional staff <laughs> member in the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. Uh, in that role, uh, Dr. Marsh is responsible to the chairman for uh, oversight of foreign assistance uh, and legislation uh, relating to Africa and global health as well. So uh, be keen to bring in her perspective. Um, so anyway, let's kick off with some questions. And maybe I should start, start with you, Josh. You were, you were deeply involved in the process. You were serving in the, uh, the White House at the time when these uh, Glen Eagles commitments were made. And, and you know, let, let's just reflect a little bit and... and how, you know, David mentioned the size and, uh, of the ambitions made by the respective nations. How would you yourself uh, judge the size of uh, the U.S. ambition and how it went about uh, achieving them and, and reflect on success uh, from your perspective? <clears throat> um, Richard, thank you. And, th and thank you to CSIS and the University of Miami um, and, to, and to One for putting out this ec excellent report. I'd I do serve on the board of one, but I, I deserve no credit for the good work that they do. So I, I feel comfortable complimenting what I think is a, a terrific report year on year because what it reflects is uh, accountability, which is, I think is the most important word and concept that can be applied these days uh, in the world of development assistance. In this case, it's accountability for uh, the nations that have made commitments to help the poorest. 
um, but one also is well focused on accountability among those who are the recipients of the commitment. And there needs to be accountability on both ends um, if, uh, if we are to, uh, to see a world in which uh, the developed world is helping the developed world um, uh, move out of extreme poverty. Um, I was around for, uh, for Glen Eagles. I was in the administration. Uh, in a way, even more important for these purposes than my post as chief of staff, which I didn't take until early 2006, was the post I held when Glen Eagles was underway.